Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Get to Know the HPO. My name is Abigail Richardson Schulte, and I'm composer in residence with the HPO. Now, today we have a special happy hour with our music director, Gemma New. Hi, Gemma. Hello, Abby. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all safe and warm, and it's really good to be able to chat about music and to feel like I'm back home in Hamilton. I can't wait to physically be there as soon as possible. And I see Abby's got a glass because it's happy hour, and we're going to do a toast to the HPO, to everyone's health, and to Hamilton. Cheers. Cheers. And well, I just have water because it's two o'clock where I am and <laughs> it's too early for me, but <laughs> I have go for it, everyone. Have a drink on me. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a great chance to catch up with you, Gemma, and uh, find out what you've been up to and also chat a little bit about what we've got coming up at the HPO. So for those of you watching, feel free to comment and uh, ask us questions as we go. So Gemma, first of all, I mean, we in Ontario, obviously we're in a stay at home uh, order and we, our concerts are paused for the time being, unfortunately. But what about for you? Are you still conducting? Uh, yes, I had a rehearsal this morning. Uh, it was, it's just so wonderful. I love music so much and I just have a joy every time we have the opportunity to play and it will come back. Don't worry. We have to be patient right now in Hamilton, um, but it's better to be safe than sorry and it will come back and the, the joy that it brings. Uh, it's going to be a euphoric experience for everyone to return to music. I know it will be. Um, and so for me, um, I've been traveling a bit to make it possible. So um, there are some orchestras that are still uh, able to perform under certain strict guidelines and I've been back to New Zealand twice uh, in maybe the last six months to do some mm. concerts there so maybe one concert a month it's my my work's being cut quite drastically but it is I'm so grateful for that that piece of, of joy and so I'm in Seattle right now um, and having a wonderful time with the Seattle Symphony. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, so Gemma, when you go to New Zealand, do you have to spend a lot of time in quarantine? <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing so. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, there's two weeks of quarantine and um, they uh, put you in a room in a hotel. Uh, your, the whole flight goes into the same hotel and uh, you're not allowed out of the room un unless you want to go for a walk in circles in a, in a oh. exercise yard. Um, so it's, it's you know, um, you have to be there for two weeks, but then you're free. And I, you know, the minute I got out of both both times uh, I ran up to the top of the hill near my house and just went for a big long hike and it was such a good freeing feeling. So, um, you know, it, uh, it was worth it. And were there audiences in the hall? Yes. Um, so the first time I went, I had 14 days quarantine and on day 14, the country locked down again. Um, and so I was, you know, devastated, but we were able to still perform um, without an audience, but we knew that they were all listening and enjoying the music at home. So that was that. And then uh, the second time I went back, uh, the country was completely out of lockdown. It was just back to normal and we had full houses um, and it was just amazing. <laughs> wow, I, I almost can't imagine that. <laughs> I, know, I felt so naughty. I felt like I was breaking all these rules, you know, and yeah. you go to the pub afterwards and have a drink and thought, gosh, it's so crowded in here. But there there was no virus at the time in the country. So it, it was it was OK. It was safe. And uh, it, it was really glorious. <laughs> right. Right. And now uh, when you're back in the States conducting, are there any um, uh, restrictions like do you or do the musicians have plexiglass screens uh, or, or any other requirements? Yes, so plexiglass is quite hot, uh, an idea that splits the winds up. So they have these big plexiglass walls um, and, and that separates the players so that um, I guess they have their own compartment. Uh, and then there's some other orchestras that say that well, the airflow isn't so good if you have plexiglass. So they don't have plexiglass. Uh, so I think it depends on the hall. I know that a lot of the orchestras are um, combining uh, or collaborating with scientists to see 
uh, what kind of filters they need in the hall, where the air flows so that we can make it all safe for the players. Um, and I've noticed, especially this week, um, the wind players do have masks and they keep on putting it back on and off every time they play and then they, they don't play again and so they put a mask back on. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it depends on everyone's comfort level. Right. Wow. How, how interesting. Um, now, uh, we've had a few comments for you along the way. Catherine Lynn says, hello, how are you? That's nice. David Francisco says, thank you. So uh, this is great. And we have a, a question submitted uh, from Heather online. And Heather wrote, we miss you, Gemma. What have you been doing to stay healthy, both physically and mentally, over this last year? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, it's so important to look at what... Um, one needs as uh, a healthy human being. And I think physically, uh, that's definitely a component. I make sure I, I run every like day or two. Uh, it's not a long run, but it, it just makes a difference to have raised the oxygen level is in, you know, like the adrenaline and the heartbeat and, and to the endurance. Um, so, so I make sure I do a, a run or a good hike. Uh, and then uh, uh, mentally, it's always good to have a project that you're working towards. I, I always need that. So um, I've made myself some personal goals and deadlines. Um, a lot of making parts, uh, that's something that I don't really have to do, but I, I'm quite passionate about making sure the orchestra ha sets off on a good foot at the beginning of the first rehearsal. So having a set of parts which are unanimous uh, in their interpretation um, and one, one that fixes, you know, is with my score, it's the same. Uh, that that's it takes a long time to make a set, but once you've done it, you have this joy of it being completed, and and I look forward to doing them with with the orchestras in the future. So you know now I have quite a bit of time to be able to to do that, and it's a, a goal. Um, and, and you know there's short term goals as well. Where we have to all cook now because you know we have to stay at home, and um, I'm a terrible cook. So positive <laughs> of that is that there's room for improvement, and I think I am getting better a little bit <laughs> and, and wonderful uh mentor <laughs> and my boyfriend's a really good cook so <laughs> i am um, i try and help not hinder and um i think day by day I'm, I'm figuring it out what needs to be done and what needs to stay on the table and not be thrown away that's that's one of the lessons that i've learned because yeah. i think they, a lot of you know try and clean up and apparently that little bit of cheese was needed or something like that you know horror um, end up throwing away the, the one component that was needed it's funny to hear you say this you know i wrote a, a piece for the montreal symphony that was um well postponed because it was uh, supposed to premiere in april and it's all about cooking it's called oh. a composer's kitchen and it sort of makes the parallel of okay like here's frying with the orchestra and i try to you know, really try to portray different composing techniques, uh, you know, uh, as similar in a similar way to cooking. I love cooking. So yeah. it made sense, like composer using different technique techniques is very similar to cooking in a way. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting you're getting into cooking now. <laughs> yeah, and I love that because uh, we're doing a piece in uh, this week uh, that's about uh, collage and so there's bits of paper being ripped up as if um, one is making a, um, a a collage on a beautiful art um, board and then um, there's the idea of um, the warp and weft of of a loom making a beautiful blanket and it's amazing what composers come up with the, how they translate um, everyday uh, projects or uh, you know machinations or, or some kind of um, livelihood that's not musical but then they uh, translate it into a musical language so mm -hmm. i'd love to hear that piece and <laughs> sounds heavy and yeah. i'm to turn the question back on to you how are things going for you in the, the pandemic yeah well you know uh i'm i'm glad to have some good composing projects uh so i'm just wrapping up a piece for tafel music the, the great baroque orchestra in toronto uh, so I've written a, a really fun uh, work for, for all ages called uh, The Gull, the Raccoon, and the Last Maple uh, with a, a friend of mine, a librettist from Montreal. So um, that is, it's like a, a modern fable, uh, if you will, but with an environmental focus. Um, so that's, that's great. And right now I'm just starting work on uh, a piece for strings and uh, baritone Russell Braun. So that'll happen in... Uh, in April, I hope, with a London group called Magistera Soloists. 
Uh, and then it's on to a uh, string quartet. We have a Canadian string quartet, all women, all original members, and they've been together for 35 years. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. The Lafayette string quartet. So um, they're a lot of fun. And uh, so I look forward to, to working on that piece in the summer. So I've got I've got projects, which is great. Um, yeah. And then uh, in uh, at, with the HPO, it's busy. It's really busy. And you know, we've got so many uh, virtual uh, concerts and virtual events now. And it actually takes a lot of work to put something together virtually. I think a little bit more than than live. Um, so as you know, we did uh, we've done educational videos. So certain of our uh, you know our, our HPO ensembles. Um, and then I also have a number of uh, history and, and theory presentations for secondary school students, that sort of thing. So making that collection um, grow. And then of course I do the pre-concert talks for the orchestra. Uh, mm -hmm. We started a new series for seniors and it's been going on for eight weeks. So it's every Monday and I'm doing it on the phone. This is a really uh, interesting way to connect with people. It seems very old fashioned to be giving a presentation on the phone, but uh, it's a way to connect with people that, uh, you know, aren't necessarily that comfortable with tech. Um, so yeah, I do four weeks on Baroque, four weeks on classical, four weeks on romantic, uh, that I start that on Monday and then, uh, onto 20th century. So that's been fun. Yeah. yeah really, um, say audio podcasts uh, rather than video, sometimes it's just perfect or, or just putting on some music when I'm cleaning the house or doing something like, you know, bowings and the parts, I find um, that oral stimulation. I'd love to get on the phone with you, Abby. And <laughs> you have so many insights into the music. And I know we'll get into a little bit of that with the Vivaldi coming up. We, we will, we will. Um, now, we have a, a question for you from Catherine. Just curious in the orchestra, how is practice conducted? For some of my friends, we're online and together when we're allowed. So yeah, perhaps you could talk a little bit about rehearsal. Sure. Uh, Yes, absolutely. So I, I think you mean the rehearsal period and and maybe how that's different. Um, and it depends on the orchestra. What um, Say I was in Atlanta a week ago and they said only 90 minutes. And so you'd have 90 minutes and then a big break of two and a half hours and 90 minutes so that there was enough time to clean the hall every time. Uh, and all the play string players and and are two meters apart and then the winds are even further apart i mean it's like ridiculous i can't even see them from <laughs> hey I'm, you back there yeah. and so with the string players it means that there's a much uh, smaller string section on stage uh, and so everyone feels like they have to play uh, the, you know, as much as five violinists. But um, at the, we do then have an audio engineer who brings that, together the sounds and is able to make it sound uh, fuller uh, and and uh, maybe fix some of the balances that, you know. Uh, so we're doing it for audio on a recording or a live stream rather than what you would hear in the hall. Um, and then they have to turn their own pages. So all the parts have to be changed so that all the page turns work for every single player to turn the page. Whereas usually we'd have um, uh, two players to a stand. So at least half the section would be able to play while the other turns the page. But now we have to deal with amazing page turns and librarians are doing all sorts of tricks. Um, and, and everyone wears masks. Um, uh, just to keep safe and, and keeps distanced. And, and there's tests that you do COVID test like 24 hours before the first rehearsal um, or in Dallas, it was every single day before every rehearsal and concert. Um, wow. And, and yeah, I think, does that answer the question? I'm <laughs> I well, hope. Catherine wrote, writes, wow, that's insane, but respectable. Yeah, as a string, it feels weird not being as close together. So yeah, I, I think you answered the question. Yeah, and, and now we have one from uh, Lennox, who is a staff member with us. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi, Gemma, speaking of food, I'm just making dinner now and I'm interested in this food or perhaps more additive that I hear is well loved in Australia and New Zealand, chicken salt. <laughs> oh Do you God. know it? And if so, can you tell us about it? <laughs> 
I have no idea. I'm sorry, Lennox, but you go for it. Try that chicken salt. <laughs> Let me know how it goes for you. I'm mm -hmm. it has that chicken flavor, like chicken stock and and salt together. Maybe like um, garlic salt uh, has that just added quality. But salt is, a, you know, to enhance flavor rather than a flavor itself. That's what I was told. So it it brings out the the flavor in the food. So. That sounds like MSG. <laughs> Maybe it's a healthy version of MSG. And you know, now you have actual chicken added to it. I hope you're not <laughs> fish. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, a really great dessert that I would say you should check into and how to make because it's um, it's a really cool way of um, having the oven open with a, just a crack and allowing it to cool down very slowly. Um, but it's like a, a meringue cake called the pavlova, and it was made uh, for the first day it was created in New Zealand, not Australia. Australia tries to steal it from us every day of the year, but it's well, it was invented in New Zealand because Anna Pavlova from uh, the Russian ballet came to visit New Zealand and we were so impressed by her dancing and her tutu uh, is kind of the shape of a pavlova and it's like a big meringue cake. But it's crusty and uh, crunchy on the outside. It's beautifully melts in your mouth in the middle and then it's um chewy on the bottom and good description i had no idea that was from new zealand <laughs> wow <laughs> very interesting thanks Gemma. um all right we have a, a few comments for you here uh judy marcel says thank you for all of your good work Gemma." um and uh a shout out here to uh heather hollis from daryl Dockstader. that's great thanks daryl <laughs> rita Brianna says hi Gemma. we miss you that's great <laughs> <laughs> now um Gemma, let's talk about the vivaldi festival that we have coming up so every year of course we have this composer festival which which has a different composer every year so why vivaldi Oh yes, absolutely. So I like to have a composer every year um, whose life has been interesting, uh, which is not hard to find. <laughs> They've all had extremely crazy lives because I think musicians travel more than probably you know most professions, and so and they're also inspired by what they see and sense on their travels and and in their surroundings. So uh, composers are always very interesting human beings, um, and. I also want to have a composer who, whose repertoire has been really important for the orchestral world, um, but also has music that our community can play with us. Um, and um, the, there's chamber music or solo music that the composer has also written um, that we can enjoy in a community recital. So uh, Vivaldi is our composer of the year, and he has an incredible selection. He has over 500 concertos that he wrote. Um, a lot of them were for the uh, school that, or um, what would you call it, Abby? The orphanage. Orphanage, yes. Uh, so um, he had a, a number of, uh, it was mainly young girls because the, the boys went off to learn how to trade and the girls learned music and he had them in his orchestra, about 60 players at a time and um, he would write concertos for them and, and a new one every week, I guess. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like Bach's cantatas. Um, he was also a priest, so he wrote a lot of cantatas himself and sacred music, masses and, and such. So, um, and, and the vocal music is really beautiful, lots of opera. Um, um, and and then, so we have a community recital as part of this composer festival, and it will be an opportunity. We'd love for everyone to get involved. If you can um, prepare a video of you performing uh, Vivaldi's music or another Baroque composer, um, you know, uh, Corelli, Rameau, uh, Handel, uh, Scarlatti, Bach, uh, Purcell, there's a lot of composers that you could, um, you know, be curious about and explore their music and see if you can prepare something. Um, we'd love to have you as part of our community recital online this year. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and Gemma, you mentioned uh, Vivaldi writing for these girls. It, it's quite amazing to think that um, this orchestra and chorus of girls and young women uh, was performing at that time because it was so unusual to have any women on stage at all. I mean, we had some sopranos, but that was pretty much about it. Um, and so uh, his orphanage became 
like a tourist attraction. Anybody visiting Venice would have to go and, and hear the concerts that they put on. And, and they were uh, great fundraisers for the orphanage too. So uh, it's quite a, a unique place in history there, this little pocket of all of this just tremendous musical education for girls. Yeah. Yes, and I, um, I, I he obviously he got a lot of experience writing music there, um, but I think his Four Seasons, which we've programmed for our main stage concert, uh, was performed when he took a trip to uh, Mantua. Mantua, mm. yeah. So uh, he had like a tempestuous relationship with the uh, orphanage, and uh, for a little time he was kicked out, and so he started to freelance, and he went. To, he had a beautiful invitation to the court in Mantua. And um, he was struck by all the beautiful countryside and the birds and the and the rivers and um, the farmyard and the hills and the trees and the wind and all that. So um, that's when he was inspired to write the Four Seasons. And you hear all of this, uh, the birds and, and the, the shivering and the ice in the winter. It was a little more north in Italy where he went. So um, um, I guess he would have felt the seasons more there than, than in Venice, perhaps. Abby, you, you mm. felt. <laughs> well, um, just, just to pick up on this as another community event, uh, I'll be doing a presentation for uh, HALSA, and I will be doing this, um, so this will be online through Zoom. I'll be giving a presentation on Vivaldi's life, but I'll be joined by our principal second violinist, Bethany Bergman, who will be explaining and demonstrating parts of the four seasons and how they relate to that story and those poems and bringing that nature to life. So um, she's really focusing on that at that presentation. So, so that'll be great. There's a sonnet uh, that's with every uh, concerto that, and they say that Vivaldi wrote them. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that poetry must be really evocative and, and help us all get into the mood of the music. It is, and, and you can really track the poem, you know, bit by bit in the piece, as he's, he's just a, such a great musical storyteller. Um, yeah, so Gemma, what else is on the main stage program? I know this is uh, paused for us, unfortunately, and we'll, we'll pick that up as soon as we can, but what else is on the program besides the Four Seasons? Yes, well, I always love when we have a program that is rich with a variety of styles, and it also, connects in many different ways. So um, we have at the beginning of the program a piece by uh, New Zealand Canadian composer Juliet Palmer. It's called Firebreak and it tells of the ancient stories of the forests in Australia and it um, it's maybe old wood uh, and, and the idea of the, the fires that have been burning there and uh, each summer and, and the idea of burnt wood still telling a story and, and kind of groaning and heaving. And she, she looked at the, the sounds that wood makes um, in its different states of, of age and, and fire. So um, this piece, I thought it looks back at the past, um, just like we're looking at back at the Baroque period with Vivaldi's music and it also comments on the environment and just like Vivaldi's looking at the seasons. So mm -hmm. um, it relates in that way. And, and it has also just such a modern uh, voice. Uh, Juliet lives in Toronto and uh, she's wonderful. And uh, so it's wonderful to have a voice of today uh, and, and that music. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, I should point out too that this piece was written just for us and that this will be a world premiere. This was the piece that was canceled actually on our March concert. It was almost about to be premiered. Um, so we, we finally get it then um, yeah. about 10 months later. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Everything that we, we've been wanting to do, we we're put, putting it uh, as a priority or yes. as soon as possible um, on the main stage. And then um, there's another piece on the program that's one of my favorite pieces. I, I be probably the 10th time I've done it. So like, I really love this piece and do it as much as I can. <laughs> and it's by Stravinsky. Stravinsky loved Baroque music as well. He played Bach's music on the uh, keyboard every morning, just as a warm up, just to feel spiritually grounded, maybe before he started to compose. And um, this was, so it's a neoclassical work. It's called Danse Concertante. And often um, Baroque music is in the concertante style. So that's where that part of it comes from. And it's the idea of a whole bunch of solo instruments um, having amazing, you know, uh, 
dances and songs to sing and and then the whole group comes together and comments and so it's so this wonderful camaraderie um, that's a baroque style of, of composition and um, Stravinsky makes it modern with a you know quirky twist by uh, having all these different colors of woodwind instruments and brass he has a trombone a trumpet and the timpani and uh, and all, all the single woodwinds, uh, all four flute, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon. So um, those uh, colors with the string players um, provides us with a whole array of, of modern, uh, and then we have all the uh, styles of jazz, and um, I, there's a bit of um, barbershop quartet, and uh, some New York Fifth Avenue, Swankers, you know, Swankering down the street. Um, it, it, there's a circus, there's a lot of somersaulting and clowns and um, and and like tongue in cheek jokes. And, um, and then there's uh, the beautiful romance, um, which I think comes from maybe the dances. So there's danse concertante. The dance part of it is that he loved ballet. Ballet really made him a famous composer. That's what set him up. So mm -hmm. um, you had the Firebird, Petrushka, Rite of Spring. And then quite a bit later on, this is um, now taking his experience of dance and putting it into this um, orchestral work. It's purely orchestral. Some people have um, uh, choreographed uh, dance to this, but uh, it, it brings the orchestra alive and it makes them dance. So I, I, I look forward to doing it with the HPO. Yeah, it sounds like a fantastic combination of works for the program. I, I look forward to it. So now, Gemma, let's get on to our Vivaldi Festival. We've already spoken about a few events, the uh, the, the Halsa Talk, that starts it all off. Um, and you can see along uh, the side here, um, uh, we're, we're posting some information about where to find these events. Um, you've already talked about the community recital, which will be a lot of fun. And by the way, Suhashni Arulanidam, second violinist at the HPO, asked, can children be part of the recital? Yes, please, they absolutely are. Um, we've got some great submissions by kids uh, already, but yes, and any level, go for it. Uh, in the past, we've had, you know, a tiny little boy that needed to be really picked up and put at the piano, <laughs> so they can be very young. Um, now, uh, the next, I am doing a couple of talks at the uh, library, at the Burlington Public Library and the Hamilton Public Library on um, basically the world of Baroque. So I'll be looking at composers uh, from Germany, meaning essentially Bach, uh, Handel was living in England, and Vivaldi, of course, living in Italy. Um, and uh, we'll also be playing some videos from our HPO ensembles, our HPO wind quintet, brass quintet, and string quartet. Um, so those will be the same presentations, but on different formats. One is on Zoom and one is on Microsoft Teams. Uh, Gemma, can you tell us about the uh, Baroque uh, techniques uh, session we're going to have? Yes, absolutely. I'm sure you'll comment on it uh, as well in your talks, Abby, because um, you know, there are different styles in history. So we have Baroque and then the classical period and the romantic period and then modern. Um, and even different composers have unique languages. So we have to figure out what does an accent mean with this composer? What does a tenuto mean for this particular composer. It could mean completely opposite things. It's amazing how different a notation uh, is uh, read by a musician and, and is meant by a composer at times. So we have to make decisions. And for all string players out there, I would really encourage you to come to this um, Baroque uh, bow masterclass or a workshop with Elizabeth Lowen Andrews, our HBO second violinist, who is providing a lot of knowledge and experience that she has with the Baroque bow and the Baroque style of playing. And uh, it's so different, even to the classical style, which was just after that, um, there and it's very important for all string players to be aware of it because um, you know you go to orchestra and you have your violin and you have your bow and you think okay well I'm set but uh, the way that a baroque bow is made means that there's a lot more weight down here and there's a lot more lightness at the tip of the bow uh, and so the balance is very different and we have to emulate that with our modern bows often and I'm sure Liz will get into all of the details to help you be able to go to orchestra and say, all right, Bach's on the program this time. I know exactly how to play this in a Baroque style.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think I'll be touching on that with uh, Bethany at the Halsa talk as well, and and asking her how she uh, is going to be capturing the the style of Baroque playing while probably playing with a modern instrument and bow. And she will be soloist, uh, as will Lance Ouellette's, uh, uh when we do our main stage concerts. They will be the performers, uh, the soloists of um, the Four Seasons. Um, now, oh great, we have uh, Liz actually commenting here. Elizabeth Lone Andrews, looking forward to it. Yes, we are too, Liz. That's great. Um, and now, uh, speaking of Lance, uh, Lance Ouellette with his wife Justina will be uh, performing excerpts of Vivaldi's Summer from the Four Seasons, and that will be released on February 20th. So that will be uh, the, the culminating event in our festival um, until we get to our main stage concerts. <clears throat> and uh, We're just so fortunate to have such talented violinists and musicians in our HPO who can perform the Vivaldi Four Seasons and who can show you the Baroque style. So we thank all of them for doing that. Yeah, this, this will be a great festival. And uh, another thing to watch out for is that we have uh, a number of our musicians making videos at home right now. They're going to be performing works and we're going to be releasing those in the upcoming weeks. So the first one is mm -hmm. Baroque and it is Melanie Ayres who plays second bassoon with the orchestra and she will be playing mm -hmm. some Telemann sonatinas. Uh, so keep an eye out for those in the first week of February and then uh, videos to follow. Now, um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about the festival here and what we've got coming up, but we also have things happening behind the scenes and, and things that will eventually be on stage. And I'm specifically talking about mentorship. So Gemma, can you tell us about the project you're involved in um, through uh, Tapestry Opera? Yes, absolutely. So uh, with the main stage programs at the HPO, uh, we have four rehearsals and we're on stage working, 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 thinking, OK, we want to get this together. We want this idea here and we want the balance to be right. And often I look around and I think, who can give me notes on the balance? And luckily, I'm often lucky that Abby's in the hall and I can say, Abby, can you hear the soloist and how's the balance? But what I would love is to have an assistant conductor so um, that mm -hmm. I can not only ask them the question and get feedback, but I can help mentor them in providing the right feedback, having done that job for about 10 years and um, knowing how to quickly say, yes, it's these points here and exactly what the problem is and how to be efficient with time and um, and knowing what to listen for. Um, and then I can talk to them about interpretive choices and what works and what doesn't and, and, and things like that. So um, this is a really great opportunity uh, that tap Tapestry Opera has uh, led um, uh, and uh, we have two uh, conducting fellows who will be joining the HPO uh, for a week each I think um, and we will figure out the right week and program for them but I, I really want to get them involved with the HPO get our orchestra to get to know them and, and maybe we'll even uh, have them speak before a concert so that you get to meet them as well um, their names are Julianne Gallant and Jennifer Tung and um, they are very talented uh, young conductors um, uh, who have a lot of promise and also experience already. And um, I just look forward to meeting them and working with them on the details. And hopefully um, they will feel like it's an experience that's really valuable to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, before I get into our, our composer element of that mentorship, I'd like to say thank you for, for uh, a few comments along the way from uh, from Daryl, and uh, we also have a comment here from Bill Carpenter, always informative and a treat besides, breathes life into my world again. Sorry to be so dramatic. <laughs> Don't apologize for that, Bill. Thank you, we appreciate it. Um, now with composers, we again have another uh, version of our HPO Composer Fellowship, which is very exciting. So this year we have uh, composers Matthias McIntyre and we have uh, Ari Verhul van de Ven. They will be writing pieces for our April and May concerts. And we also have two HPO Future Award winners, uh, two uh, young women from Ottawa. We have Sophie Dupuy and Natalie Jacques, and they'll be writing pieces with which will be read at our intimate and immersive concert in rehearsal, and they'll get a they'll get a uh, 
uh, recording of that and mentorship through our library and with us. So it's great to have four young composers and uh, and continue with this fantastic program. And I'm, I'm so proud that we're going ahead of this despite the current season because we still have all of these young composers out there that are just so eager to get a foot in the orchestral world. So it's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, Abby, for leading this um, project with the composer fellows and for what you do to, because I, I I will tell everyone that Abby closely mentors these young composers and um, you know with the creation of a piece um, it, it's really good to have someone wise there looking over your shoulder just saying okay this is probably not going to work or maybe you want to cut that down a little bit or <laughs> are you sure that's going to be heard when you have a trumpet blaring at 40 um, you know it, it's it so it's great that you take them on board and and um, I know our orchestra loves working with them. And I think for our audience, we're so fortunate to have music of today and to have these voices um, and their what they want to share through music being presented on our stage. And um, I think for the curious that you'll be enticed by every single, um, you know, um, it's like a, a picture and, and uh, the, the way that they evoke their message is always so incredibly different from each other and yet it was written this year today like at the same time and in you know a very similar environment i love um getting to know their unique language and and also getting to know these composers as, as colleagues as well and seeing how well they do afterwards as well um mm -hmm. really has been doing great work. Aline Ritz, our previous um, HPO composer fellow, and um, and see, so you know, it, it's it's always why do we do music? Uh, why are we musicians? I think one of the main reasons is that there's so much room for growth and for learning, and so this is a point where when we discuss. Uh, music of today together we say oh, I love that concept there I, I, I that's a brand new idea for me and I'm inspired by that and so by working together we come up with these new inventive ways of of composing mm -hmm. yeah our, oh there's Michael Fedition did someone say trumpet <laughs> you both yes Gemma said trumpet that's right um now uh Gemma we just have one more topic uh before we say goodbye today and that's that we are re-releasing our fall concerts uh of the, the chamber music concerts we perform so uh do you this, this is great so we can watch them again at this time where we're at home do you have uh any anything that you know we might want to pay attention to as we go back and listen again or, or something that struck you by these concerts? Oh, well, I mean, I hope everyone's been enjoying the intimate personal side of this chamber music and also our players. Um, it's like a gift from from all of us, uh, you know, from a, a, and each player personally to you, the listener. And um, so I love the way that they tell a little story about the piece before they play it. And, and you should know that every musician was in a discussion about what they would play before we programmed it. So um, many of these pieces, especially with the woodwind solo works and the whimsical woodwind program, those were chosen by our um, woodwind principles. And so, you know, it's a really a, a beautiful personal message. Um, if you want something that uh, serenades you in the most elegant grace, I would go to the September program because there's Mozart and his Viennese uh, traditions there. There's also the Telemann music, which is gorgeous, um, like dances and, and it's quite simple, but uh, so peaceful. I, I love putting on those Telemann duos just to relax and smile <laughs> at home. <laughs> so I, I'll definitely be listening to that one again. Uh, and then you have a lot of colorful, uh, in contrast, uh, say the Ginistera in the Mozart program with a wonderful virtuosic uh, performance by Leslie and Ale, and also the Woodwind program from October. Uh, just some of those works are incredible yeah. all the vivid color and the imagination that these composers had with saying i can make the bassoon sound like a bird in the forest with you know the the breeze going past i just i love it and um each and every one of, of our players just sounds incredible gorgeous um and the barber uh summer music at the end of that program 
It's one of, uh, one of the most beautifully played performances of that work I've ever heard. Uh, so go check that out again. Mm -hmm. And then in November, we went to more, um, say, deeper, darker side of music. Sometimes uh, it's not all sunshine and roses. And I think we've definitely felt that in 2020 at some point. Um, and this piece, uh, sorry, this program looks at the past and, and memories that are quite fond and, and happy and then realizing a present state of grief. Uh, and it's talking about maybe the transition into death uh, and the afterlife in, in many of the works and what life really means when it gets gritty. Uh, so you have, uh, I, there are pieces in this uh, November program, this Remembrance Day program that's uplifting for the soul. So it's not all dark, don't worry, but like say the Bach is just so most, most beautiful thing. And we had Morning Song by Vincent Ho that is a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's also the darkness of the Shostakovich, especially as he looked at the ruins in Dresden and just thought, gosh, where is my life going to? So, um, you know, a lot of contrast of the, but deep emotions uh, that I found really moving watching our players perform that. And I hope you can enjoy that once more. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Gemma. I, you, you touched on a, a lot of uh, my favorites in there too. Um, I, I won't go through details, but I'll just say that in general, um, I really love the chance to, uh, well, this is, this is called get to know this session, but I think our, our whole season has been get to know the HPO. Right. Um, and, you know, we, we've had a chance to uh, speak with all of the players individually. I'm just delighted to have them involved in the pre-concert talk. So please, if you're re-watching uh, re those uh, concerts, have a chance to meet these players in the pre-concert talk. Um, and as you say, the introductions to the pieces as well. And we get to really look, uh, look at these players themselves, what drove them to become musicians. And, uh, and also, you know, some of the ins and outs of their instruments. We get like a, a super focus on their instrument and then we get to see them playing as a group. So we can really understand, I think, uh, a, a lot sort of looking from the, the inside out, if you will. So I, I think uh, they've been delightful and I encourage you to, uh, those of you watching to go and um, explore these once again. Well, we have uh, we have come to the end of our, our time here today. Um, now, uh, thank you for, for joining us. We have a few more comments here. Uh, David Yeager, fascinating. Thanks uh, for such a, an interesting discussion. Thanks, David. We hope to have you on here soon, actually. David wrote a piece for Mary J and uh, her husband, Larry, and uh, they're going to be performing that soon. So that's great. Those are uh, well, some of those community videos coming out shortly. Uh, so thank you very much, Gemma. Thank you all of you for joining us. And Gemma, we look forward to having you return to Hamilton very, very soon. Oh, and, well, and thank you to Abby as well. Let's give her a round of applause. And uh, <laughs> thank you to everyone watching. I hope you stay warm and well, and I can't wait to see you as soon as we possibly can to Great. enjoy some music again. And let's give a final cheers. All right. this, is, this is happy hour after all. <laughs> all right. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.